So I'd love to start by asking each of you if you could share with us an aha moment that exemplifies how your placemaking efforts around food have met with success. So if it's okay, Sabina, let's, uh, let's start with you. Oh, hi. Mm -hmm. Hi, everyone. And uh, aha moment. <clears throat> I think uh, when we started, when we launched uh, our market in 2009 in Tokyo Park, um, it was the idea that came from the women, from the com community itself, who came to know that there were many women who were running businesses from home, informal businesses, you can say, like as uh, quiet operators. So we thought like um, market would be a platform for them um, to start up their business or as Thorncliff is um, uh, densely populated in a high immigrant area and um, immigrants look for the opportunities there. So we thought like market would be something uh, that would be Ben, uh, be that would benefit the immigrants and also immigrants go through a lot of isolation and stress on a regular basis and that could help them to come outdoors and meet at a center place where they can um, break the barriers of uh, cultures, languages and uh, opportunities as well. Okay, thank you so much. I'm, I'm really looking forward to, to hearing more about it. And Anita, how about, how about you? My what, aha moment. What, what was your <laughs> aha moment? Well, there's lots of aha moments, of course, but I would say one of the things I always can remember about the early introduction of food at Dufferin Grove Park is in the winter time we have an outdoor uh, ice skating rink and um, it's very popular for some uh, pretty rangy young fellows and um, we got into some real problems like it was a long time ago now where the, some of the skaters were so grouchy and so mean to each other and to other people at the rink and, and so we thought well maybe we can make it a little bit nicer by uh, getting a stove and baking some cookies and bringing in some apples and I think we did some hot dogs too but um, uh, and, and very, very quickly we realized that the guys uh, must have partly been really mean like they were because they had been skating for hours, a lot of them, they forgot to eat anything and they were really hungry and uh, adolescent guys often don't understand that hunger makes them mean. So then when, when we introduced the apples and the you know, and the cookies, first of all, the cookies also made it smell nice, so it smelled more civilized, but the, there, it was this strange vision of these, all these rows of hockey players eating apples and cookies, and they very quickly turned a lot nicer, and we thought, wait a minute, people have to eat. Right. So that was a really good start for so, us. So you found food was really a way to bring people together yeah. in the park space. Well, and to even act nicer. Right, mm -hmm. right. And I'd love to hear about what's, the, you're both doing such innovative work in, in your respective park spaces. Was there a particular inspiration that you were drawing from, or perhaps other examples that you heard about that inspired you to, to get involved in your local parks? Mm, I think the inspiration was uh, all the women who are part of the committee itself. And uh, the other inspiration was like uh, from the Friend Blue Park, which uh, um, we, which, I mean, we really appreciated that kind of model and wanted to do something like uh, what's happening in Dufferin Grove. Right. And uh, Yuda has been providing the advocacy for us uh, since the beginning, like around the public spaces and um, all the, um, you know, how to navigate this, uh, the process at the, at the city level. And uh, especially, you know, like uh, a community engagement model. Yeah, it is a little different. Like we, one size doesn't fit all. Mm -hmm. So looking at the community and the diversity in Thorncliffe Park, so that was the model that we uh, brought in Thorncliffe. Well, that's why inspiration is a nice, nice way to frame it because we know that each community is obviously so unique, but we can be inspired by, by other examples from, from, from other places and other communities and then really figure out what, what works in each of our communities and, and, and local spaces. How about you, Yuta? Were, were there other examples of um, works or spaces that, that you were inspired by? 
Well, yes, there was a place called the Children's Storefront, which was actually not a park at all, but it was a, a gathering space for people that was kind of unprogrammed. And the nice thing about a park, of course, is that it has no walls. Um, but also the down part is that people often are shy with each other. And I think Toronto is such a remarkable place for all these different groups that don't know each other, but that have perhaps quite a lot of interest for each other if there's a way to kind of get a little bit more in touch. And so uh, I would say probably one of the main things that inspired us was the picnics once the barriers came down and, and it was easier for people to come together and have picnics with each other, with their friends. And, and so then you would get to see and you would think, wow, this is a really nifty way of having food in, in the public space. So we, we, we were curious and we stole ideas from them. Well, and the inspiration will, con will certainly continue. There's, there's, there's quite a lot of community members in Regent Park that would love to, uh, to visit both of your park spaces so that we can continue to be, be inspired there. So we'd love to hear a little bit more about the kinds of programs that you run in the park, especially those that have a, a food focus, that, that really use food as a way to bring people together in, in public spaces. So in both the RV Burgess Park in Thorncliffe, in Thorncliffe Park and at Dufferin Grove Park, you have outdoor markets, bake ovens, community gardens, among many other things on offer as well. So let's start with markets. Markets can be a wonderful way as you both know, to bring people out and to animate public space, and they're also an opportunity to strengthen regional and local economies. So could you tell us a little bit about the market in your park? How did it start, and, and describe perhaps a, a typical day at the farmer's market? Perhaps we can uh, start with you, Jess. With me? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, well, we started our market because the farmers wanted to start it. It wasn't an um, initiative by any of us, although we were really interested and pleased when they wanted to come because actually the first park market in Toronto was started by a woman called Elizabeth Harris at Riverdale and so she got her foot in the door and 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 the same farmer said we need something in that west part and so we were like okay let's try that uh, and I mean since they came uh, it's a year-round market that we have in the winter time we share this rather small rink change house the same place where the kids were eating apples and cookies and, and uh, it's pretty crammed um, in the summer, it can spread out more. Um, but I would say that uh, very, very quickly, because there was already stuff going on there, the farmers were welcomed. And, and then, of course, they bring all these wonderful things. And, and uh, the other thing that I would say is, is, and I know this is so true for what happens at Thorncliffe as well, is that people talk to each other all the time, like it's such an amazing social space. Yeah. And I would say our, one of our big con continuous problems is that people forget their grocery bag mm. because they, they get to talking. <laughs> but I mean, why not, right? Okay, thank you. How about you, Sabina? Um, can, can you describe the, the market in, in um, we started the market in 2009 and, um, uh, you know, the beginning, the first market on um, Friday was, I was very, very nervous with uh, just um, like five uh, vendors participating um, and we thought like the market would uh, definitely uh, build the self-esteem of the women in the public park and, uh, you know, uh, and uh, improve the conversation skills and uh, the women who come from uh, South Asian countries where the English is their second language. So, and uh, I thought we thought like uh, market would definitely empower women. And we had like uh, the food um, vendors and uh, the beer vendors as well. And uh, we were so excited and looking at how the park completely transformed on the first market day with nobody to like around 500 people gathering on Friday night and uh, all these women coming to us and asking how they can participate or be part of uh, this market. That's fantastic. Have you, so you talked a little bit about um, local women coming to the market to, to sell things that they prepared. How was that aspect of the market? Um, in 2009, the city was on strike, so we didn't go through all the permit process and all. And uh, these women, they prepared food at home and they brought their, uh, uh, you know, the food from, we got the food from different cultures and, uh, you know, 
the, all the residents gathered and they wanted to buy food from these vendors and all. So it was really good and the uh, park uh, became a gathering place for all these uh, new immigrants in Tonopla Park. That's really our, our vision for the new farmers market in Regent Park as well. Um, there's a new market that was just launched last summer and one of the biggest issues that we've been struggling with there is trying to find the balance between very much wanting to support local and, and organic vendors but also wanting to, to make the products affordable for the, the community members there. So that's, that's something we're still, still struggling with. Um, but that's the, the, what you describe uh, for the market in Garncliffe Park is something we're very much looking at trying to figure out how we can encourage uh, local residents to come out and, and have an opportunity to sell things that they've prepared to, uh, to potentially generate some, uh, some income on the side for people that live in the, in the community. So really interesting to, to hear about that. Thank you so much.